Today's gospel lesson comes from the 13th chapter of Luke. I'll be reading verses 10 through 17. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus, Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for eighteen long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise to God. I want to talk about this morning uh, uh, a crippled spirit and uh, missing the point. I think we're all guilty of missing the point sometimes. I often think about how many businesses have you seen go out of business. They start out on fire. They start out with a, a customer-driven uh, motive and a customer-driven service. And all at once, they're covered up in business. But then at some point, managers start taking over and the managers manage and they know all the government rules and taxes and so they kind of become more like bureaucrats in a way and sales and service people spend more time looking down at their paper instead of up at their customers and pretty soon the business falls apart at some point they miss the point of why of why they're in business is to provide a, a, a good or a service to a customer and when you miss the point and you're a business Trust me, there's a dear price to pay for that. It's called bankruptcy. So, uh, so uh, that was, I relate that to the church in many cases, especially in this day that uh, we read our text. The church had become that place where the, the, the bureaucrats, the, those that were overseeing the church, were running, were running the church. And it's, it's, uh, it's too common in our churches today all over the country. So this, this uh, woman in the story, she's released after 18 years of pain from a crippling spirit. Now, a true faith community would have been very excited about that. A true faith community would have fell on their knees, would have been singing hallelujahs to God because this woman who was in bondage is now set free. Throw all the protocol out the door. It didn't make it to the bulletin. So, so it, was, it just happened uh, uh, ex officio, I guess would be the term, or extemporaneously. And, and all of that is going on, and the people, the, the bureaucrats, they get indignant about it. Somehow they miss the point. I have a nephew, my sister's uh, uh, son. His name is Brandon. Fine looking young man in his, in his 30s. When he was about eight years old, somebody told him he was husky. Do y'all know what husky means? <laughs> and uh, so he decided he's going to go on a diet. He goes and he buys himself a big case of Slim Fast. Chocolate flavored. Starts drinking two a day. He's doing good, but in a couple weeks, his mom noticed. She said, he's gaining weight. And Brandon couldn't understand. He said, Mom, I don't get, I, I've been drinking two Slim Fast every day, along with the big meals that he had continued <laughs> to eat. He missed the point that somehow you're supposed to take those big meals and replace them with that chocolate milkshake. Along the way, Brandon somehow missed the point. In our text, Jesus, Jesus walks in to the midst of the synagogue. He walks in speaking reconciliation and salvation and bringing healing upon his, upon his word. And, and, and they miss the point. This is, in Luke's gospel, he describes it as the very last time that Jesus uh, enters the synagogue before his death on the cross. And he walked into the midst of these religious bureaucrats and somehow they miss the point. And in the process, they become to look like fools. They go from being indignant to humiliated. Well, can this be our own personal story? 
Is it possible that, that that's us at times in our lives that we see that we begin to have an event in our lives and we get bogged down in, in, in details of it instead of seeing the much larger picture of what God is doing in the midst of this crowd, in the midst of these people, in the, and, and especially to the poor woman that was bent over with a crippled spirit? It, can, it, can it be possible that we miss the point at times? Can that be our own personal story? Am I a hypocrite at times when I'm left hardened with ritual and, 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 and the need for healing cries out all around me, but yet I'm stuck in my, in my ritual? Am I the clueless one who can't see past the point that some I didn't get dotted or a, or a T crossed? L Remind me, Lord, that my salvation is based upon the woman that was set free. I know about that woman that was bound in a crippling spirit. I know about what happened when Jesus came into my life and set me free. I know about that crippling spirit and not necessarily follow the protocol that somebody had, had designed. Let me celebrate restoration and not analyze the doctrinal, uh, uh, the doctrinal soundness of it. The story in our text is part tragedy and part hope. Luke doesn't go into a lot of detail. There's only really three pertinent verses here. There was a woman who had been, who had been deformed and, and was in a painful body, and she was looking down. We don't know her name. We don't know her family background. We know that she was in the condition for 18 years. So the, the implication is she wasn't born with it. She may have had some calcium deficiency. Some doctor could probably diagnose that, a spinal injury. Maybe it was in her DNA. I, I don't know. We're, we're simply told that a spirit had crippled this woman, and Jesus called over and said, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. So this woman who has all been over, she can't see nothing but the dirt. Instead of the stars and the sky and the moon and the birds and all the glory of God, all she's stuck is looking down at the ground. And Jesus says, look up, straighten up. And I'm not quite sure what to make of this crippling spirit, but we're told that she began to praise God. When that, when that happened to her, in some way, in some way, this crippling spirit was responsible for this woman's condition. As we look closer at the story, there's another spirit at work in this story because of her particular ailment. She was all bent over. I know folks back at home that I remember spent a good part of their life bent over because of maybe a back injury or, 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 some, or some debilitating injury that they've had that, that has pushed them and forced them. They walk around all bumped, all humped over because they, and they miss the glory of all that's around them. But physical ailments can do a lot more than being the back. It can rob us of our livelihood. It can cause bankruptcy. It causes division in our families. It causes severe depression. It causes all sorts of things. When sickness comes, it brings a lot of changes to bear in our lives. We become identified with the disease instead of the person. And I want to caution you as we, deal with, as we deal with folks that have some kind of a disease, never let the disease identify you or another person. We are human beings and sometimes we get sick, but that sickness is not who I am. That's not who, who God has created me to be. We're human beings and sometimes I'm sick and in the midst of that trial, we want to be identified with that sickness. Don't let that happen. That's what's so disturbing about this synagogue ruler that comes on the scene. He was so insensitive to this woman's plight, even though technically he had truth on his side. Healing is work and should have been done, shouldn't have been done on the Sabbath. But Jesus had a greater principle at stake here. It's called compassion. Compassion trumps rules, even the Sabbath commandment. For this reason, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, he called him a hypocrite. You take care of your animals better than you do the children of God. Isn't this a woman? Isn't this the, the daughter of Abraham of the covenant? Is she not more valuable than your, than your farm animals? 
what Jesus is saying, that restrictions and laws and rules and institutions, if we're not careful, will keep us from raising to the heights that God is calling us to be. We're called to be children of God in a lost world. We're called to proclaim the good news of what God has done and is doing in our lives. And if we're not careful, we'll get bound by a crippling spirit. I, I've used the term before of church anity. Boy, don't let church anity get in the way of being a child of God. There is no inappropriate time to express compassion. We're so guilty sometimes of just missing the point, even when it's obvious. It's easy for us to major on the minor and minor on the major. The woman had been healed. Praise God. The woman was healed. Don't miss the point of the story. There's a story connected with John 21 where, where Simon Peter had fished all night. He drug his nets to the shore and, and Jesus comes along and they were, they were feeling down because they'd worked all night long. And, but they, Jesus said, throw your nets on the other side. And they come out and the nets were full of fish and they didn't break. And, and there was 153 fish in that boat. Now, why in heaven's name was there 153 fish? Did you ever wonder about that? Well, some people have. <laughs> Augustine's theory in the 5th century, he noted there's 10 commandments. And 7 is the perfect number of grace, so 10 plus 7 is 17. And if you add all the numbers from 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 all the way up to 17, guess what number you get? 153. So it must be something to it. And then besides that, if you arrange those fish in descending order from 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, you create a triangle, which is exactly the replica of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have a, a sign of the Trinity. But you missed the point. The boat was full of fish. In a time you didn't fish, you didn't fish in the daytime in, in the Sea of Galilee. The water was crystal clear. The fish could see you. You fished at night, which is what they had done, and they still pulled the boat full of fish. Now we can get caught up on whether there was 153 or 152. I don't know, but frankly, I don't care. You got to miss. You don't miss the point. How many angels can sit on the head of a pen? I could care less. That's totally irrelevant. To me, we miss the point. We, we, we miss the point so many times in our lives of what God is doing. We get caught up in little trivialities of life and still miss the point. So there's a couple of spirits at work here, and that's the point. And we witness these spirits at work in our lives. And the first spirit at work was the, a spirit that had attacked this woman. She was all bent over physically. He said that she was crippled by a spirit. And the second spirit at work was a, was a, had attacked a religious man, but not physically. They were concerned over the law. That was the human law. They were concerned. They were missing the point. He had been attacked by the Spirit. His soul, his soul was crippled. And both of these spirits are very important. For the religious leader, he's saying, he's saying perfectly logical explanation. He's saying, you know what? This woman's been sick 18 years. She could have been sick 18 years in one day. You could have waited until tomorrow. Because there's another story where a man had a withered hand that Jesus healed on that day. Well, he was probably born with a withered hand. What difference would it have made if he had healed him on Monday or the, the very next day? Both of these cases could have been dealt with the next day. But I believe Jesus is making a, a, a declarative point here that don't, don't miss the point of what God is doing. He's doing a new thing, and if you'll open your eyes, He'll do a new thing in you. He'll do a new thing in your life. He'll speak peace to your heart in the midst of a crippled spirit. These were not emergency room situations. Now, if, on the other hand, if Jesus had healed a, a child with a, maybe a, big, a bad fever, death was imminent, Probably the relig religious leaders wouldn't have said a word. But these weren't emergency cases. You see, that was the test. I think Jesus broke the rules to make the point that people are more important than rules. 
The synagogue ruler didn't see, see it that way because he was able to dehumanize the woman. And when you dehumanize somebody, you label them and you're able to dismiss them. Two things happen when you have a legalistic spirit. The rules rule you. And your rules supersede the well-being of everybody around you. The rules become more important than the, than the, than the person. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13 that I shared early, at the earlier service, it's the, it's the love chapter, and it talks about all these great things. If you prophesy, if you, if you do all of these great things and have not love, you're, you're just a clanging symbol, or I call it a ding-dong. You're just, in other words, if love is not motivating that which you're doing, then you need to check out what you're doing. Love must motivate what we do as the church of Jesus Christ. Love motivates what we do. Love motivates why we do what we do. Love motivates everything we should be about as the church. The law of God was made for them, not, not the other way around. You can hold a person down under the bondage of an evil spirit. But that's not who we're created to be. We're created in God's image to walk in the newness of who God is and what God is doing in our lives. You can take us humans and put, and put us in the world and the world will, will suck the life out of you. The world will pull you down. The world will, will offer that crippling spirit that you'll never be what God has intended for you to be. But when the Spirit of God fires you up and you jump up and, and Jesus comes to you one day and says, stand up and be set free, honey, you want to jump up and down. You're ready to shout. You're ready to get happy in the Lord because you know what the Lord is doing and has done in your life because you know where you've come from. We're born spiritually much like this woman. When we come into the world, we're born of the seed of Adam. So we come in, we're born bent out of shape. We're in trouble. All we can see is I and mine and my and what affects me. In other words, I'm so inwardly focused, I can't see anything of the glory of God. I'm looking toward myself. I'm looking about, I have a selfish nature. We miss the point that we belong to the God of the universe. But you let Jesus come along and strengthen, strengthen us. And he basically says, straighten up. He says, stand up. Point your, your head toward the heavens. And then suddenly we realize that we're sons and daughters of God. Suddenly we realize the value that Christ has placed on each one of us. We are God's chosen people. We're not called to walk with the chickens. We're called to soar with the eagles. We're called to be children of God in this hurting world. Society has a way of dehumanizing us. When we're not focusing on God, when we're focusing on the things of the world, we fail to see the worth that God has placed in us. This woman's back was bent. That much is true. But a legalistic spirit bent this man's soul far worse than this physical condition. Nothing can choke the heart and soul out of a child of God worse than legalism. I'm the first person to say that a Christian ought to live a disciplined life. But when we become rigid in our beliefs and we realize that, that the disciplines of the, of the Christian life have, have crippled us, when they become much more important than the soul that you're trying to spare, does this mean we don't have to have rules? Of course not. The rules are not meant to be tyranny toward people. They're meant to draw people toward us. They're meant to, to be uh, edifying to us. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. Jesus comes to us as the restorer of humanity. He comes to us and allows us to see our tremendous worth. God sees, sees each of us as a unique and precious individual. The third spirit then takes over. The spirit of joy. You see, I believe the whole town would have known this woman. 18 years she walked around that town all bent over. And I believe that the children of God begin to rejoice that, rejoice that morning. Sometimes you just have to simply express your joy. There comes a time when we have to shout for joy for what God is doing. 
There comes a time we need to get excited. There comes a time somebody preached here just recently. It's time to get happy in what God is doing. It's time to get happy and, and rejoice in that which God is doing. I tell you, I tell you how. It's by recognizing the joy and the grace of God in our lives. And when you recognize that through the risen Christ, Honey, you want to jump sugar barrel high. You get excited. You get excited in who Jesus is. You escape from the world of condemnation into a world of God-given grace. Never count people out. If they're sick, nurture them back to health. If they're down, help them up. If they're not up to the task, teach them. If they have a burden, lift it. If they have failed, encourage them. And people who have worth, as people who have worth in the eyes of God, we're called to minister to those that are hurting. And that brings a spirit of joy in each of us. And these spirits are at work in the world. All of them are at work, both good and bad. Which spirit is at work in you? Is it a crippling spirit? Is it a legalistic spirit? Or is it the spirit of the joy of the Lord? that gives you strength to walk daily in a world that's broken and messed up. And, and yet, God has given us the power to walk daily in the newness of life. God is doing a new thing in your life if you'll let him. God wants to give you that life if you'll get out of the way, whichever it is. Spirit of joy or a crippling spirit or a legalistic spirit, whichever it is, I believe God is calling us to a spirit of joy. So I ask you now, as we, as we bow our heads for just a time of reflection, let's bow our heads just for a moment. The spirit of joy makes all the difference in our lives today. I pray for that one here this morning that was just barely able to put one foot in front of another because of a crippling spirit, a spirit of unforgiveness, a spirit of aggravation, a spirit of dread, a spirit of fear. Whatever, whatever spirit that they were able to, to bring into this place, I say by the name of Jesus Christ, Arise, stand up, cast your eyes heavenward and know that the God of the universe is on the throne, that Jesus the Christ is offering you peace and wholeness today. May the joy of the Lord fill every saint of God in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.